to record for real. No, it's going. <laughs> okay. So this is chapter 25, The Unity and Person of the Christ. You know, one of the things in historic Christianity that just absolutely boggles one's mind is the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully human. Um, how can this be? I mean, you've already seen some of the problems because uh, Jesus is, uh, God is, is invisible and he is immortal and he is omniscient and such, and Jesus is none of those things. Uh, he dies. He can be seen and touched. He changes and grows. Uh, he's not omnipresent. He's not there when Lazarus dies, the whole point of the story. He is not omniscient. He does not know the second coming, day of the second coming. Uh, he's got uh, just, what in the world? How can those two be together? How can God become man? Uh, the uh, Anselm wrote a big book on that pondering this whole question, Curdeus Homo, how can God become man? And at one level, I'll give you the simple answer, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we don't know. Uh, there's a lot of things that we simply don't know. And at a real level, you know, that doesn't bother me. I'm working here with this computer in front of me. It's a very nice computer. Uh, does all kinds of amazing things. And I absolutely have no idea, <laughs> no idea how that thing works on the inside. You know, I, I've got my phone with me all the time pretty much and I use it a lot. Uh, occasionally I actually talk to it. Uh, and I don't know how the thing works. I don't know how it connects into cell towers, how it, I can be driving down the freeway at uh, more or less speed limit, uh, talking, doing my mobile office type thing. And it, how does it do that? And the answer is, I don't know how that happens. So the fact that I don't know how something can happen doesn't mean it can't happen. It just says that that knowledge has not been given to me and it may be past my comprehension anyway. So don't, 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 don't let your faith be limited to what you can understand. That's actually some of the objections against Christianity is, well, I don't see any way that can happen, therefore it can't have. There's lots of things, lots of things, lots of things. I don't know how it happens, but it does happen. In some cases, I'm not sure that anybody knows how it can happen. Uh, I have a friend who uh, was just discovered with some colon cancer, and, and they took her into the hospital, and they opened her up uh, and hacked out a piece of her colon and such. And Now she's out with her husband, and, uh, you know, how do you get two pieces of colon to come back together and then heal back up. And my physician friends tell me, we actually don't know how that happens. We do know that it does. And we know some things that accelerate that or hinder that. But actually how the cells knit back together, it's past our comprehension. Now maybe someday we will understand that, but there are lots of things beyond understanding. So when you think, how can God become man? It passes our understanding. Don't let that throw you for a loop. The point of it is we want to understand what we can do with that. So take a look at one of my favorite passages, Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29, a great passage. Oops, let's get it right here. Deuteronomy 29, 29. And here it talks about the secret things belong to the Lord our God. And those secret things need to stay with God. We need to be okay that he hasn't told us. But the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. And that's that balance I want to maintain here. I want the balance between those things that God has not revealed to us. I want to leave that in God's hands. And I want to kind of be okay with that, though my curiosity is not. But the things revealed to us, that we're going to dig into. And that's what I want to do today is dig into pretty deeply a uh, couple of key passages that talk about how God became man. Uh, so let's, oh, let's start with kind of my favorite passage. Uh, let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Uh, and this is a place where you're going to find a little bit of difference in translation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go with the ESV translation to start with, English Standard Version. 
uh, and I'll come back and look at the NIV, which translates a little bit different, actually a little bit different emphasis. And this is a place where I drill a little bit further, there's some points of disagreement, but I want to look at the points of agreement first. So I'm looking at Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, and here's the phrase, who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Okay, so two verses there. I mean, just, oh my gosh, packed in this ancient poem. Christ Jesus was in the form of God, morphe theou, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and it goes on to his death on a cross. What's the key verb there? What's the key verb? When you look at that phrase, uh, Christ Jesus was in the form of God, did not account equality to God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. What's the key verb? And the answer is it's emptied. There are other verbs in there, but the key verb comes after the but. That's the finite verb that kind of is the hinge of the whole thing. And then when you look at the poetic poetry of this, you got emptied himself. Above that, you begin with form of God. Okay, And down here below that, you've got form of a servant. Here you've got equality with God. And here you have likeness of men. Okay, So think about this again. He begins form of God, equality with God, empties himself to take on form of a servant, nature of a man, likeness of a man. Okay, what do we think about this? He emptied himself. That's kanao is the, is the Hebrew word. Uh, ekonosin is the form, it's an aorist. Uh, what did he empty himself of? I mean, this is what did he empty himself? Did he empty himself of divinity? Well, no, he couldn't have done that. That would be, that would be canoticism. That would be, you know, that's a way to solve the problem, but it's not a good way because then he's not God who is among us when he saw that he is. What does he empty himself of? Uh, more faith the form of God, before more faith dulu, form of a slave or servant, after. And I, okay, well, let's stop and think about that. Let's talk down at the bottom, morphe de lu, morphe of a slave. Is that a statement of essence? Are some people by essence fit only to be slaves? Well, if I run back here in the United States, you know, 175 years or so, and look on the East Coast, there are some people who many would say are fit only to be slaves. They're the the Africans who have been brought over and sold into slavery. And because they're African and because their skins are dark, they are by many seen as lesser humans and just not quite up to it. They need to be taken care of and they're best done as slaves. On my side of the world, the West Coast, there was another group of people who were treated the same way and for the same reason. And that's the Chinese. Chinese were brought over from China and they were viewed to be lesser human beings, fit only to be laborers, cooks, and clothes washing when they built the railroad. Now, they were not bought and sold, as Africans were on the East Coast, but still, they were lesser human beings. And in the, I don't know, the equality movement that I lived through in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was a, it was led by Christians, who said, no, 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 all people are image of God bearers. And that's true because in Christian biblical understanding, no human being by essence is fed only to be a slave. We're all image of God. So in a Christian perspective, what does form of a slave mean? Well, that's a role or a lifestyle. So people can be a slave. You can do that today. You can take a work, a job in a large corporation, and you're pretty much a, you know, you're you're an employee. In other cases, we're just consumers. You know, this is a role that we take on. It doesn't change our humanity, but that role or lifestyle, that way of life, 
is what morphe dulu, way of a slave means. It's, so he takes on the lifestyle, the way of life of a slave. So what that suggests back up here is when he talks about morphe of God, form of God, is he's not talking about the essence of God, he's talking about the way of living, the lifestyle of God. Okay, I know this is getting a little complicated, but bear with me. No, stay with me. Stop and listen again if you need to. Role or lifestyle, done here for form of slave. So when he talks about form of God, he's talking about role or lifestyle of God. Now, how many people live in the way of living of God? And the answer is three, Father, Son, Spirit. Not angels, not humans. Only God lives there. So it's not that's saying is he has divine essence, but that's not what it's talking about, I think. Morphe Deu, form of God, talks about the role or lifestyle of God. And I think what he empties himself of is that divine way of living, the divine prerogatives, something like that. And he empties himself of that divine way of living and takes up a human way of living, the, and more than that, really, a slave way of living, and then goes down from there even to the terribly shameful death on a cross. What does he empty himself of? The divine way of living. What does he empty himself to? The way of living of a slave, of a servant. He also has before that the uh, does not account equality with God a thing to be grasped. So he has equality with God and he empties himself of that. Is Jesus equal with God? As Jesus, after his emptying, after his humiliation, as Erickson terms it. Uh, and the answer is, he really isn't. Look at John chapter 14, verse 28. John 14, 28. He's talking to the disciples here. You've heard me say I'm going away, I'll come to you. If you love me, you rejoice because I'm going to the Father for, here's the thing, Father is greater than I. Now, there are those who take this and say that, that Jesus is not equal to the Father ever, and I don't think that's what it's saying. I think it's saying as Jesus is God-man, he is given up that status of equality. Now, he's still God but he's given up that status of equality and take up the status of a human. So he's morphe theu, form of God, equality with God, but he empties himself of those as the form of a slave and the status of a human. I think that's a good picture of what's going on there. I think that's what's going on. My analogy of that is uh, when I check into a hotel these days, they give me a card, they give me a key card, and that key card will get me into my room, it'll get me in some outside doors, it'll get me into the exercise room and a couple other things, there are a lot of places that won't get me in. The general manager of that hotel has a card that will get her into everything. And the analogy I use is that the second person of the Trinity, the Eternal Son, had a, if you will, an access card that is a, <laughs> It's a divine level access card. And he takes that card and he puts it in his pocket and he takes up a human slave level access card and he lives in that lifestyle. Now, he still has the divine card. It's in his pocket. But he's given up the use of omniscience and omnipresence and immortality and such. And he lives using that human access card, that human lifestyle. And uh, so you get these crazy things like, how does he have supernatural knowledge? Well, I think he gets it through the Holy Spirit who reveals it to him as it reveals to us. That's why you've got spaces where he doesn't know what's going on. Uh, that's an analogy. I find it useful. Uh, let me show you another one. If you go to NIV picture of the same passage, if I go to the New International Version of the same passage, it translates a little bit differently and gives another understanding of how God can become man. In your relationships, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who in very nature God, there's more faith who, did not consider equality to God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by 
taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Now ESV says emptied himself in translating ekonosin. This says he made himself nothing, which is certainly a possible translation. NIV is a good translation as ESV. What's he saying here? He made himself nothing by taking, adding, the nature of a servant. So in this understanding, the picture would be that he has his full divine lifestyle and equality, doesn't lose it, but he adds to it full humanity, the nature of a slave, nature of a servant. So he has full divinity and then he lives his full humanity. And then what it means is, although he has all the powers and prerogatives of deity, he won't exercise it any further than a human would. So the analogy that's used is, uh, say, uh, the 100 meter champion from the Olympics who just runs like crazy, oh my gosh. And let's say that he is uh, at a church picnic and he's running a three-legged race with his five-year-old son. I'm making up a story, of course. Uh, so here he is running with his son. I mean, he's the fastest man in the world. And he's in a three-legged race with other people from this church picnic. And he's in third place. Why? Because his son doesn't run very fast. He's only five years old and he's not a real good runner. What's the champion's uh, temptation? Pick up the kid and win the race. But what he doesn't do is that he will limit the use of his incredible powers to what his five-year-old son can do. And that's another analogy of how God can live as human, is he just limits the use of his divine attributes to those attributes the way a human would do it. Uh, my inclination, my inclination is go with the ESV, that he empties himself of the use of the divine attributes, not of divinity, but the use of the attributes. Uh, and this is a place where we all are going to have some different perspective. But here's the thing, this without any question. He begins with the divine heavenly life and he humbles himself to live as a human, fully human. Let's look at two other verses real quickly and we'll be done. John 1.14, uh, this word, John 1.14, the word who was in the beginning was, was with God, and was God, that statement of deity we talked about in the earlier lecture, the word became flesh. So here he becomes something that he wasn't before. Become means a change of lifestyle, a change of status, or something like that. Uh, a conforming to, if I become married, it means that I'm going to conform myself to the love of my pretty wife, which I did a long time ago, sort of. The word conforms himself to flesh. And that flesh is the same word that's used for Adam and Eve. The two become one flesh. You're talking about concrete, meaty, full humanity. The word becomes flesh and tabernacles among us, makes his dwelling with us, his tenting with us. So he is defining like the tabernacle in the Old Testament is God in the tent. And that becomes a powerful picture of what he's doing. But the, the word changes his way and becomes conformed to life. You find that's very similar to what's being said in Philippians 2. One other, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2, starting at verse 5. Hebrews 2, 5. Talking about subjecting the world to come. And then he quotes from the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 8, What is mankind that you're mindful of them, a son of man, that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned with glory, put everything at his feet. Um, and then in verse 9, he says, that's Jesus. Now, there's a hermeneutical issue. Did, when David wrote Psalm 8, was he thinking of Messiah or was he thinking back to Adam? Uh, I'm inclined to think it's both that he's looking back to Adam, but he's looking forward to Messiah, but that's a bigger issue than we have here. Certainly that's why the writer of Hebrews is understanding it. Psalm 8 is talking about the Son of Man who began higher than the angels and becomes lower than the angels for a time. And he says, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. Uh, that he might taste death for everyone. So as we look through that, 
and begin to unpack that a little bit, come down to verse 14, Hebrews 2. Since the children had flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. Again, there's that statement, the one who is above the angels is now sharing in the humanity of children who are concrete humanity for the purpose of breaking the power of the devil, and he could free us. Verse 17, for this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way. So again, we find this very strong statement of the one who was above the angels now coming to be fully human in every way. He might become merciful and faithful high priest, atonement for the sins of the people, uh, and can help those being tempted. It's just absolutely, absolutely, absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. So what do you make of this? In this model of incarnation, whichever facet you take of it, we have this true picture of God becoming human while still being God and living among us to do a couple of things, bring God and man back together. It, uh, in that incarnation, we have that God is dwelling with us, fully present with us, not as God, but as human understanding, as working with us, showing us how to live, able to make atonement for our sins as a God-man so we can experience his goodness forever. It's, oh man, it's astonishing. How can God become man? I don't know, but I think the way he does it is through this way of humiliation that we all agree on. That he gives up the perks and privileges of heavenly life to come live with us in our brokenness, live fully with us in our brokenness, so that he can take us back up into his heavenly life now and forever on the new earth. And that's the picture of this model of incarnation, the model of the coming of the Son of Man.